as a journalist trying to cover this patch, what are the obstacles you face? Because this is obviously a long running story which doesn't always have immediate impact unless there are floods and fires. So how, how difficult do you find it as well, you a journalist know, to cover? The problem with journalism in general at the moment is that it has become extraordinarily difficult to engage with policymakers in any government department, in any public institution, in the way that one used to. We used to phone up the Home Office and ask for a briefing with officials and nearly always we'd get one. Nowadays, when you ring up any government department and ask for a you know, detailed engagement about policy, um, you'll be told, can you, can you submit some questions in an email? When they know that you're right on deadline, they'll issue you with an extraordinarily bland statement, which will say, um, you know, this government is, de is, is determined to you know, do the very best it can. We have a tremendous gap between uh, engaged media or the, an, an impossibility of, of, of engaging as journalists and try and raise issues with people who make decisions is really difficult. It's down to the media to tell these stories and, and I think what David's really indicating is that even at a corporate level um, the access to information is being withheld unless you're playing the game. This is like a massive capture in that way, uh, same, same with the uh, ecological crisis, you know, the, the, the leaders aren't, aren't dealing with the issues. The first government report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the first major set of reports came out in 1990, that's three decades ago. So even the climate progressive countries have fundamentally failed to address their emissions in the last 30 years, despite the fact we've had lots of rhetoric around this. So David, I'm wondering about your thoughts as a chief scientific advisor to the government on how receptive governments are to that kind of advice and also I think that you've also in addition to trying to advise on climate change you have previously also tried to advise governments on pandemics. There was a very big difference between working for the government from 2000 to 2008 and then working for the government from 2013 to 2017 and basically that difference was the the austerity budget. During the period when I was chief scientific advisor we ran a big program of work on flood and coastal defences for the United Kingdom. We, we simply said on the basis of the best models that we have today a very big part of the United Kingdom would be under severe flood risk. We began a program of investing in managing flood risk uh, uh, downwards. And this was a successful program. 2010, that funding was completely drawn back to a level that it was at before that report I produced was made. And if, if I now say to you, the floods of 2012, 13, the worst in our history, were what we were predicting back in 2002, 2003, loss and damage was about half a billion pounds. If we had not put in place that program, my belief is it would have been closer to 100 billion pounds, right? So there is an, an expenditure that manages to save money, and yet the expenditure was cut back. It's the same with COVID-19, and I believe a report into government that has not been made public in 2016 indicated already that our hospitals would not be ready for an epidemic of this kind. The problem here is that we have this resistance to, to, to sensible policies like this, like a carbon tax, because of the threat that it poses to GDP growth, which is one of the reasons why, effectively so far, we've not done anything meaningful when it comes to, to climate policy. That's exactly the same fear, incidentally, that prevented our government from acting more quickly on the COVID-19 crisis. I mean, I got a piece of information two days ago, but it was only shared anecdotally. It was a woman who is in the press office of the government and she has been given on a regular basis press releases from the chief medical officer calling for changes in response to this COVID crisis and Boris at the last minute has pulled them. Dr Rupert Reid and I and, and a person from The Lancet and others wrote um, an article saying that uh, we believe the precautionary principle wasn't being followed with regard to this COVID crisis. On the fact that the British government are the biggest subsidisers of fossil fuels in, in Europe seems to me like a bigger agenda to focus on. Um, so we know that this is a time when, when people are not paying enough attention uh, to the environment and sort of, you know, focus on one crisis, ignoring the other. Carbon capture and storage is a fig leaf for the fossil fuel industry if we're not careful. That's all. We are already seeing 
institutional bias towards those technologies and away from mitigation, whether that's in the IPCC and mitigation scenarios, whether it's in the Committee on Climate Change's um, net zero report, we've seen that at the global level, that there is already a reliance on these technologies that do not exist, which is allowing us already to, uh, to not put in place the mitigation, the carbon reduction approaches we need to use today, both technically and socially. So whilst I'm fully in favor of the technologies, but it is already being used as an excuse for inaction on difficult issues today. There was a report a few years ago called Thinking the Unthinkable, which was that politicians and business leaders were unable to think about crises. That's a really significant thing for a report to conclude, that unable to think about crises. These are the people that are in charge of democratic outcomes and, and policy making. We've already heard that Professor Rockstrom from the uh, uh, Potsdam Institute has said that around half of the world's going to die if, as came out this panel, we're heading for three to four degrees of warming, half the world's going to die. And it, 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 it just beggars belief that we're not going to take proper action to deal with that. But the problem is our democracies have been captured to vested interests and we have an economic system that's, that's, that's geared to kill life on earth.